I was fresh into a new career directing studio feature films. Uh-huh. Do I want to go to television? And then I realized, it's The Stand. It's Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> Welcome to Scream Dreams, The Nightmares That Shaped Us, where we sit down with your favorite filmmakers and creatives and talk about their nightmares and what really terrifies them. I'm James A. Janice. And I'm Catherine Corcoran. And today we have a veteran podcaster, arguably the le- most legendary genre <laughs> podcaster. <laughs> oh, I'd like to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> but also director, f- writer. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm sorry Barbara can't be part of the group. <laughs> Don't give it away. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay, it's okay. Cut. No, it's okay. Take two. No, it's okay. Some veteran. Yeah. <laughs> no, she might still You gotta join tell us. me. You gotta she tell me these things. She might still join us. Who oh. knows? Who it's, knows? A, it's a thing. <laughs> Warn me about this shit. <laughs> it's, the it's the world's worst surprise. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Mick, thank you for joining us. Uh, like Catherine said, uh, you know, obviously you're a filmmaker, very. Um, uh, Made a lot of great movies, including Thank one you. with uh, Lin Shay, who we've also talked to. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, but the, for the past seven years, you've been running Postmortem, which is probably the horror podcast when it comes to interviews with people. It's, it's just you've gathered up everyone yeah. you think to talk Thank to in the you. horror yeah. genre and uh, have such wonderful, insightful conversations with them. How did that get started? Well, it really got started as a TV show, but even before that, way back in the late 70s, uh, before that, I started interviewing rock stars when I was a teenager for my high school newspaper, and then I published my own magazine when I was 18 years old in college. But um, doing it for media, um, I, I did interviews for the old Z channel back in 1979 and 80, which was the first pay TV channel in Los Angeles. I had Steven Spielberg on, I had Toby Hooper on, I had John Carpenter on, I had Jamie Lee Curtis on back at that time. So I had just been a journalist doing these things for print media when uh, I took my idea for doing this show to the program director of the Z Channel. So the Z Channel strangely and fortunately enough, was in high-end neighborhoods like Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, West Side stuff. So even though it was a very small show on one cable company, it was seen by the Spielbergs and the the high-end people in the performance world. So I was doing these TV interviews as a very green young journalist, nervous and all of that. And so that's where it began. And then Back in 2010, Peter Block at Lionsgate was running the FearNet TV network, online TV network, and they asked me about doing an interview show for them. And that's where Postmortem, the TV show, began. And those shows, we did 10 of those, William Friedkin, Rick Baker, Carpenter, uh, Landis, uh, a lot of these people, and they're all available at mickgarrisinterviews.com. So then... Uh, Joe Russo, my producing partner on the podcast and in making the film Nightmare Cinema, he was at a party where he met somebody from Podcast One, which is the biggest podcast company in the world. And he suggested that I turn my TV show into a podcast without me knowing it. The head of the company (laughs) uh, of Podcast One uh, asked for a meeting, and they were pitching me on how we could do the show, say, you know, Adam Carolla makes seven and a half million dollars a year on his podcast. Well, the year I was with Podcast One, I made five hundred dollars. <laughs> so, but as you know, you don't do this for money. Yeah, <laughs> you do it for love. Um, and so that's how the podcast began. And being a filmmaker first, the guests I was able to get were people I knew or worked with or had relationships with, and. That led to more people wanting to be on the show because I want to be on the show Stephen King was on or, mm-hmm. or you know, uh, our last one-on-one interview was with Quentin Tarantino and we got James Wan before that. So for seven years, we had a pretty pretty great run before I decided to call Mission Accomplished. <laughs> I mean, I think you did. I think it is Mission Accomplished. I mean, yeah. But I, I, 
I also you mentioned Stephen King, and you've you've also made quite a few yeah. Stephen King films yourself. Is there is there a favorite? Is there was there something that drew you to him initially? Well, we first met on Sleepwalkers, where um, I was asked to meet with the studio, and then they hired somebody else. That somebody else started changing King's script a lot, and uh, so they decided to come back to me, and that was the first time we ever worked together, even though. He was in Maine and I was in LA. We would talk on the phone. We would fax pages back and forth. Oh, Remember wow. faxes? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we we really had a great time doing that together. And he was really happy with how Sleepwalkers turned out. It turned out to be a financial success, critically drubbed. I mean, <laughs> it was not well received by critics at all, though it is fondly remembered and and remains popular at festivals and the like now. But um, when The Stand was coming along, he asked me um, if I would be interested in doing that. And, you know, I was fresh into a new career directing studio feature films. Uh Do I want to go to television? Back when it made a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then I realized, it's The Stand. It's Stephen King. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I want to do that. (laughs) And so that became the most successful miniseries of all time, the most watched of all time. And uh, so that kind of continued and deepened our friendship and our our working relationship, which I've ended up doing like seven or eight King yeah. projects. And, uh, and hopefully there's another one in the works. So. Is that like a record? I mean, I feel like I don't know any. We're number one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're number you better one. watch it. I think Flanagan's coming. Well, on. Flanagan's is. coming on he strong. Is. If anybody deserves it, it's Flanagan. <laughs> yeah, he's a great filmmaker and a great guy. He is. He is. We had him on. It was yeah. it was so amazing. He was on our show more than anyone else. I oh, think really? he was on four times. On postmortem. Yeah. Oh, oh great. Five counting our our farewell show. Oh, he was uh, one of the panel. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean he's a he's a great guy to talk to. Like you are, you're, you're both uh, such gentle and kind human beings. <laughs> yeah. which... Well, I find that to be the case in the genre. You know, people expect, oh, all the horror makers are lunatics. They must be crazy. They must be <laughs> madmen. They must be heavy metal type people. And <laughs> you know, you find when you work with people who bring nightmares to the screen, they bring it with a lot of care and vision and and perceptiveness that a lot of people uh, filmmakers in other genres don't bring to it because you're dealing with fears and that's something that's incredibly intimate and personal to people Mm -hmm. and to be able to go deep enough into where it matters to make films that don't just jump out and go boo Mm -hmm. but affect you more deeply and resonate with you after the credits roll it takes people who do care and who do have hearts and do, who, who do have souls. And, you know, I, I, I find filmmakers within the genre to be incredibly kind people who get their shit out in their <laughs> nightmares, you know, rather than repressing it. Those are the people who scare me. What are your nightmares? You know, my nightmares are not about big, scary monsters or about ghosts or things like that. I rarely dream that I remember. My nightmares are more about, you know, the health and safety and lives of the people I love and care about. You know, I I have lost a lot of people close to me, including a lot of family members, a couple of brothers, both parents, a sister. Um, I've held hands with death a couple times myself. And... uh, the real world is a lot scarier. Donald Trump is the scariest nightmare I know of on the planet. Um, and I find the real world a lot scarier than than rubber monsters or, or uh, cinematic ghosts. That's why I love Stephen King's work, because it's so grounded in the real world. There's just one step away from the supernatural, but it's grounded in... Uh, lives that we all live and yeah. understand and identify with. Yeah, King's magical realism has always just is what dr- has always drawn me to him from being a kid. Because you're yeah. right, it's, it's the world we live in, just like a little bit of a modification. Yeah, just like a, and, and it's the kind, it's the amount that like you wish for. It's like you know that the wizards and Harry Potter and and the 
alternate dimension in Narnia aren't real, but like someone may be having a little telepathic communication. Like you kind of wish for that to be real. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I always say the beauty of King's work is that it's not about the monster in the closet. It's about the people who own the house that has the monster in the closet. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, totally. I, I that and that is always what like that's what makes the films terrifying. The books obviously first is it's this idea, it's this character driven stuff which we don't see always in horror, uh, particularly with like the rise of uh, slasher popularity. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. the ideas of this of the characters and their arcs and what makes them human and interesting, and even even the killers, be them supernatural or otherwise, what makes them interesting. Sometimes. I find that gets kind of tossed by the wayside for like yeah. gore and and just like big kills, which is still exciting to an extent. But if you can't connect with the people that are suffering, then- Well, it's just the difference between Halloween and Friday the 13th. Halloween is about a group of characters that you not only identify with, you were those characters. Mm -hmm. Friday the 13th is a killing machine that even the trailer when it first came out, and I know we're talking late 70s, yeah. mm -hmm. but- it was kill number one, kill number two. They went through 13 kills in the trailer. To That was how they sold the movie. Whereas Halloween really nodded towards Psycho and by more than just casting Jamie. Jamie, Lee, <laughs> yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, Janet Lee's daughter in the, in the lead role. But those, you know, Deborah Hill brought a lot of that to, to the screenplay that she wrote with John Carpenter. Mm -hmm. But, you know, two classic slashers, one of them sticks with you because of who the people were. The other one was a launch pad to a series of sequels that it really didn't matter who the characters were. They were interchangeable with one another. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you see that. I, I've listened to, uh, just as a woman who works in the genre, I've listened to quite a few interviews with Jamie Lee Curtis, and uh. she talks a lot about how um, people always ask her, like, what was it like to be like the first scream queen? Like, what did that mean to you? And she always says, it you know, honestly, it didn't really mean anything. And I don't, and she's like, I don't mean it in a negative way. It's just that like- It was a job. Yeah, yeah. I was doing the job. I was telling the story. It wasn't like we knew this was going to be this thing that everybody was going, this this formula that everyone was going to latch onto and you no. were going, there was going to be these like tropes of women that were established. It was just like, I'm portraying a character and I'm going to tell this story to the best of my ability. And then I moved on and, it, and she didn't even see, um, interestingly, the financial su success that maybe Friday the 13th did see because right. for, be, uh, those actors did in their careers because they didn't know that this was going to take off. You yeah, know, I mean, it was not a union film. Yeah. Like, yeah. Paramount distributed Friday the 13th. They produced mm -hmm. and distributed that. So they had all the agreements with the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, the Screen Actors Guild. Halloween, I'm sure they were Screen Actors Guild actors, but the distribution was an independent distribution company. They, they weren't uh, signatory with the Writers Guild and the Directors Guild. Mm -hmm. So other than the deals that Carpenter and Hill made with Mustafa Akkad at the time the movie was originally made, if they had not had those deals in place, they would have been like so many other independent filmmakers seeing really successful movies that they never participate in the money from. Yeah. I feel like, you know, just based on that answer and from your seven years of interviews or much longer than that, but seven years of the podcast, you're you're basically a horror historian, you know. <laughs> Not intentionally, but I but it is something I love and I care about and and that matters to me. And you know, uh, if you work within a field and you don't have knowledge about that field, you might be working in plowing the wrong field. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And is, is there a particular occupation that you? first think of yourself as like do you think of yourself as first an interviewer or a director or a writer like i feel uh, i think of myself as a writer first okay uh -huh. and i started writing when i was 12 so i've literally been doing it for 60 years and it's something that i love i don't need to consider a budget when i'm writing i don't need to consider a cast i don't need to consider how we're going to do the effects or whatever i i it's unlocked and when I write on spec, which is how I do almost everything, I never go to studios and pitch something with the hopes that they'll buy a pitch and pay me to write it. I just write 
what I am passionate about, what a story I want to tell. If it sells, great. If it doesn't, that's fine. It's been a month of my life that I can repeat over and over. Uh, the writing process is something that comes easily to me, and it's something that I, I love to do, and it's it doesn't feel like work. So I'm a writer first. Uh, the directing, you know, I'm a producer last because <laughs> what I really enjoy is the creative process and the producing part. Most of that creative process is putting together the right creative people, yeah. mm -hmm. the team. But the business part of it is something I, I'm not interested in. I don't involve myself in any of that more than I have to. So you're saying as a producer, you like the the part? That I like the bringing, creative, creative part, part. Yeah. of yeah. bringing people together, finding a script or writing a script, mm -hmm. and then bringing together a cast uh, like Nightmare Cinema or Masters of Horror. Yeah. yeah. Those were anthologies where we actually brought people to the project and gave them my job was to enable them to do whatever they wanted <laughs> as long as they did it on budget and on schedule where I had to worry about that so they didn't. Yeah. And I think that you may be honestly the premier person in that position when it comes to the horror genre. Like like we've said you you've written and directed a lot of work but I feel like you're such a good facilitator of uh I, I don't know just collaborations and bringing people together within the space uh it just feels like you have connections to everyone and are able to to have people meet each other and yeah i really the rolodex that. of horror yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I love that i i found that it's it's one of the things that i have also uh found a strength in doing is, is bringing people together and being like oh you should meet this person and uh you know like a, a friend of mine um Barbara ended up collaborating with them after meeting at my house and and just like seeing that happen is so rewarding to me. Yeah. Yeah, and uh I I'd like to think that, you know, that you've met some cool people. Yeah, honestly like I think I never intended to work in genre. It's kind of where I ended up, you know, for yeah. you kind of, not that I wasn't always a fan, it's just, you know, where yeah. the work was. Right. And I was very early in my career, I was very <laughs> nervous to do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing and I didn't know if I quite fit and I was like young and trying to figure out the conventions and everything and when I where it really started clicking actually was when I moved out here um and part of it was it was really Barbara uh who mm -hmm. who facilitated that where she she made a point to and in bring me into the community and introduce me to people. And I never had a support system that yeah. I had. And like, that's what I think is so unique about the genre that you just don't see in any other real sect of the industry is this like collaborative support for whatever you're doing. Well, and we're like all in the same it. gutter together. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. yeah. We, it is not a respected genre other than the money that it makes. Mm -hmm. yeah. People don't studio executives, development executives, uh, managers and agents, they don't care about our genre uh, other than the financial end of it. But when you're outsiders, and the outsiders are the ones who are not only drawn to as audience, but as creators, that's the field you go to. You, you make stories about the other, about feeling like an mm -hmm. outsider, not about the popular kids in school, but the renegades, the the people who don't feel comfortable, and and that brings us together. That's why there's horror genre conventions. Mm -hmm. There aren't comedy conventions. There aren't <laughs> Western conventions. There aren't romantic comedy conventions, but there are horror conventions and festivals all around the world, mm -hmm. and it's a bringing together of people who feel like they're not only fans of a genre, but they're part of it. They want to own the the special edition 4Ks yeah. you know they they want to read the magazines and the online magazines and the dread centrals of the world and the fangorias and be a part of it because they feel a part of it it's not a passive involvement by just watching a horror movie mm -hmm. and moving on to the next one you know a, a, a mainstream movie you go see the hangover you laugh and you don't go out and buy the script and you know yeah. read everything possible about them. It's a little a little warm in here. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Are you, is that our sidebar? I, I, I think it's coming. coming. I Aww, think it's time. That's so nice. You did bring her up that she would be joining us <laughs> yeah, today. That's right, yeah. That's, she was foretold. Uh, yeah, yeah. She usually comes right about 
No! No! Oh. You're not Barbara. I'm back. Brian Collins! Hello again. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Brian. Nice to see you. I'm <laughs> sorry I'm not Barbara, but... Yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 that fits. Yeah, that's okay. not a slight against yeah, you. No, that's no. just no, because it's against you. Did she yeah. send you again? She from did. She, she thought, you know, maybe because Mick is a, a, a fellow silver fox, she thought <laughs> you, could, uh, you know, we could bond. And, that's you right. Know. One writer to another. I like it. <laughs> we go way back. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of writing, I was curious because I just started reading uh, uh, one of King's books that I hadn't read, an older one. And I'm just curious. It, have you read everything at this point? Is there any like not all of the fantasy ones? All of the things? <laughs> I've read just about all of them, but I haven't read all of the gunslinger books. Mm, Most that, of them. That's one of the ones. Yeah, it was yeah. the he added one later. Yeah. I've read all the originals, yeah. but he added one later that takes place in the middle. So yeah. I'm, I'm reading that one for the first time. But I'm curious when you get a new book from him, because you've done so many adaptations and you're kind of like the the king of them. Uh, the king. Well, of the king. king. Uh, uh, do you do you do you read it first as a fan, or do you start looking at it like? Oh, I, I always read I his here. books. I know what I could do here. No, I no. I, do that. Yeah. I always read his books as a fan. Mm. You know, uh, usually he sends them to me, which Ooh. is really nice. Awesome. But um, I'm. I'm never reading them to think, "Gee, will this make a movie or a mm. TV show or something?" I read them because the way I read them since the 70s. Like mm -hmm. A new Stephen King book, Hot Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you currently reading? The, 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 wind, the wind Through the Keyhole. Okay, the, I haven't read that keyhole. one. Yeah, that's, so it's like Dark Tower 4.5, I guess. Oh, okay. it, like, he, it came out after he finished the series. He's like, I'm going to sneak another story. Kind of like, saw, <laughs> right. like the last Saw did, where they're like, oh, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. gap here. We can Let's put one in the middle. Yeah. One. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I had never read it before, so I started rereading the series. And then I got to that point. I'm like, oh, now I can read this one. Oh, great. So okay. it's, it's, it's been fun. And I'm also listening to it. Oh, oh the Stephen read, Weber? Because, Stephen Weber. Yeah. 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 Read My it. wife did that, and she cried. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. He's yeah. one of the best readers of audiobooks mm -hmm. uh, of all. He read a short story of mine that's on my website that uh, that you can listen to for free. <laughs> <laughs> I might just do that. Yeah. yeah. So, should we get into the game? Yes. Barbara, yes. Barbara this has scares instructed me. me. I, I will <laughs> okay. not let her down. I will I will fill her role as best I can. Okay. Wow. Uh, if I could see. <laughs> I like the glasses. Yes, it has yes. To these are my, very these are my uh, I'm getting old and I can't. I mean, <laughs> the worst is when I'm at like a restaurant or a bar and the bill comes. I'm like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're getting way bigger tips sometimes, I think, because I can't read it. Uh, best to be safe than sorry. Uh, this game is called Escape the Nightmare. Okay. Um, so in this game, um, we, uh, we're going to give you a nightmare scenario. Okay. And it's based on a hybrid of two of the films that you have worked on. Okay. Um, they've select, then selected at random. Uh, and your challenge is to come up with a creative and imaginative escape plan from this scenario. Um, so uh, you will come up with the escape strategies, and we're going to kind of maybe throw a, a wrench or two in the works there okay uh, until uh you finally awake from this damn nightmare. i'm gonna suck at this <laughs> uh and uh should i tell him the films or should i let him figure out what the films are from the scenario oh that's up to you i think that's fun if you want yeah. yeah all right yeah. I, I i assume it'll be very easy i think it's pretty out. obvious you're not gonna be like what? there's a giant ball of <laughs> yeah. critters yeah. you're like what is this the shining what are you talking about <laughs> You know what's a nightmare? Dehydration. Yeah. You know what's an even worse nightmare? Plastic pollution. And that's why we love Liquid Death and their evil mission to murder your thirst and kill plastic pollution. That's right. Their aluminum cans are as metal as they get. So <laughs> pick some up today because we all need something uh, refreshing to reach for when we wake up from a nightmare. It's true. Cheers. <laughs> Here's the scenario. You are visiting the enchanting town of Salem for a lovely <laughs> Halloween weekend with your family when a mystical incantation uh, brings the Sanderson sisters back with a plan to suck out the lives of all the children of Salem and seek revenge on you for constantly writing films with their turn to dust. Uh, while concocting a potion designed to attract you and the children of the town to their cottage, 
Mary accidentally mistakes critter eggs for chicken eggs <laughs> and drops them into the cauldron, <clears throat> unwittingly unleashing dozens of mischievous and ravenous extraterrestrial crites onto the town. The creatures uh, wreak havoc, devouring everything in their path, as critters are wont to do, including the Book of Spells. And now they're coming for you next. What do you do? <laughs> well, I go into the underground and, and solicit the help of Billy Butcherson. Mm. Take his head with me <laughs> and hope that his body follows and use him to, uh, to, to use his sway over the Sanderson sisters uh, and try and talk them out of these nefarious deeds. The critters, on the other hand, um, people don't know this, but they're vegetarians, so <laughs> they're not really a problem. They only act up uh, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> That to keep eating like fake meat, you know, for everything. <laughs> exactly. Well, yes. They but, they eat beyond burger people. Yeah. <laughs> well, it just so happens that you have in your car a a container of beyond burgers. Oh. Because you you were afraid that there weren't going to be, you know, you've heard that cannibalism is a thing that seems to run rampant in, in <laughs> Salem and you were not one to eat small children. Right. So you came, you know, prepared. Yeah. So now they are definitely coming for you. And unfortunately, Billy Butcherson has been recast and is not Doug Jones. <laughs> oh and no. Can no longer have the same sway because he can't communicate with the sisters as effectively. Well then I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think I'm going to die. <laughs> we talked about me not being afraid of that, so I can confront this without a lot of problems. My my family might think otherwise, but, uh, well, um, I don't know. You know, the Beyond Meat would have been my dodge, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it's going to be my uh, Waterloo instead. It's going to draw them to my position and I'm going to be devoured and I'm going to give myself up into it and allow myself to make that sacrifice in order to save those around me. I don't think I've ever had a guest just uh, give up. <laughs> just die. Just it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, well, you enough. know what? I guess that is a, uh, they say in your dreams when you die, you wake up. So I guess I'm never going to wake up. No, at that point you, you just would get eaten and then wake up and then you've, uh, Escape the nightmare. So, <laughs> so I think you found a loophole. Yeah. In this yeah whole of thing. course, give it to the writer to find the loophole. To yeah. The uh, yeah. That's a, yeah. Well, it's like, the no only notes. hybrid between Hocus Pocus and Critters 2 I've ever heard. So, <laughs> so well done, Brian. <laughs> Would you would you want to pitch that to Disney? I think you know maybe. Yeah, what does I don't want to like pitch say <laughs> anything to Disney. No, no, actually, they are doing a Hocus Pocus three. So. Uh, oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you involved? Can you nah. Tell? Oh, okay. I wasn't involved in two. Do oh. Do you get any? You know. I'm supposed to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Disney's very cash starved. Give them a break. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You know, yeah they, things are tight. Take care yeah. of think, of, think of the poor then, corporation. You know, then they can, think of the then poor they can corporation. Spread them poor Disney. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. I hope. Uh, Sorry if that was a cheat. <laughs> no, no, no that's it's great. quite brilliant. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you, all three Good of you. Good to see you again. Oh. Good to I see you. I hope Barbara is able to join you next Thank time you, as Side scheduled. Brian. Yeah. If and not, I hope wherever she is substitute. right now in my place, I hope she's doing well. You know what? You're a good beyond Barbara. Thank you. I, <laughs> <appreciate> <laughs> it. I, like, this. Beyond. I yeah, like the beyond yeah. Barbara. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you could also be an impossible Barbara. Yeah, that's true. It's yeah. true. Because it is impossible to be Barbara. Exactly. Yeah. There's only one yeah. Barbara. You'll always be able to tell the difference. True enough. It's the resemblance is uncanny. I don't. I. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Thanks, man. Hey, oh. Thanks, Ryan. See you later. Bye. Bye. Oh. 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 He's good. There he goes. He's getting pretty good at this, though. Barbara's, you know, teaching him well from beyond. You know, it's it scares people. Just the term horror film mm -hmm. really, uh, really turns a lot of people off, and it, it's too bad because there's so much great stuff out there, and. One of the stepping stones uh, to horror is reading Stephen King. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I started his stuff can young. be really explicit, or it can be, it can gently get you there. You know, mm -hmm. Carrie was the first one, mm -hmm. and um, you know that was something 
anybody could read and get into despite its intensity, you know. Mm-hmm. But King is one of those people because his stuff is so much richer and deeper and more human than most, people don't call it a horror movie. The Dead Zone is a magnificent book and movie. Cronenberg, mm-hmm. Cronenberg's most emotional movie, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it comes from the world of Stephen King. I, I think he's a great stepping stone, and he's been the greatest ambassador for bringing people into the genre, mm-hmm. whether it's been an intentional ambassadorship or not is <laughs> in question. But yeah. Do you have a favorite subgenre of horror film that you like to watch or uh, a favorite type of horror film? You or? know, I, I really like international horror. I like because I travel a lot. I go to film festivals around the world, mm-hmm. and I'm introduced to movies that I would not otherwise see. But I just, I just like anything that takes me by surprise. Yeah. Anything that I like, well grounded. I don't like really fantastical stuff. Although there are always exceptions to yeah, the rule. You know, poor things. I love poor things, and it would not normally be a movie if you described it to me. Oh, it's so fantastical and so many fantasy elements to it. It was uh, not my kind of thing. Loved it. Mm-hmm. But it was also grounded by these great performances by Willem Dafoe and Emma Stone mm-hmm. that were fantastic. Um, but I like suspense thrillers a lot, and they can go supernatural. Um, you know, what's the David Kep movie? Uh, we're going to need some editing here, I think. But, um, the Richard Matheson story uh, that Kevin Bacon was the star. Uh, Stir of Echoes. Stir of Echoes. That's a ghost story. Mm -hmm. And it's great. It is so scary and so human and so beautifully done. Um, David Kep uh, adapted it from Richard Matheson's novel and directed it Mm -hmm. as well. I think it was his directing debut, if I'm not mistaken. He had written the script for Jurassic Park, among other things. Mm -hmm. And that is one of my favorite. I, I love a good ghost story. Mm-hmm. Going back to The Haunting, you know, the yeah. original The Haunting still works great. Um, and, you know, I've written ghost stories myself more than once. And Clive Barker is great at doing ghost stories and the like. But I I like a real wide panoply of, of horror subgenres. And it's the reason we made Masters of Horror in the first place. Yeah, get a little sampling. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a horror, or not even horror, is there a film, but uh, ideally horror, is there a film (laughs) that you uh, have written or worked on that you felt like you were confronting a fear through? Well, talking about scream dreams, I rarely dream that I remember, but my story I did for my first Masters of Horror film, Chocolate, was based on a short story I'd written a dozen years before Uh by that name. And it's the only thing I've written that came from a dream. I had a dream once that I wasn't doing it myself, but I felt what it was like to murder somebody, but it was through somebody else's action. They were stabbing someone with a butcher knife and they could feel, I could feel the blood running down my arms the hot blood running down my arms. And it inspired me to write this short story. And then years later when we made Masters of Horror, I had tried to adapt it into a feature many times and it got very close and never happened. But that is a key scene in Chocolate, Mm -hmm. the Masters of Horror film that I made from that. And what did you feel like when you were, like what did you think you were confronting psychologically? Well, the actual experience of killing someone in such a violent way that blood was spilled and that blood was spilled on me. Uh Mm -hmm. So I'm not afraid I'm ever going to kill anybody. Yeah. And I didn't in this dream and in this story, Henry Thomas plays the lead character who experiences this, but he doesn't kill somebody that way, but he feels someone who is committing that act in an, uh, across the country that he doesn't know. Mm. Um, And he doesn't know if it's real or if it's a dream or what, and along the course of the story discovers it is someone who has committed this murder for a crime. It's a crime of passion, but in a very complex story that unfolds uh, as he tracks down the roots of this story and this experience. So it's a confrontation with violent death, 
that I was able to make safely through <laughs> the confines of my own story. Are you afraid of your own violent death? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, I've discovered this even more than I realize. I'm not afraid of death. Oh. Um, I'm afraid of yeah. debilitation. Sure. You know, and, and disease, loss of limbs, you know, just... I've I've gone through. I lost a brother to AIDS. Who that was two years of debilitating illness that you would never want to go through or anyone to go through. But um, almost exactly three years ago, I had a widowmaker heart attack. It was something that just thank you, mom and dad, for your great genes. You know, I've <laughs> been vegan for all these years. I exercise all the time. I take care of myself. But I had a heart attack that has a 12% survival rate, Oh my gosh. this kind of heart attack. And I never thought it was going to kill me, but when I'd heard that, I was sanguine with it. I, I was surprised at how not afraid of losing my life I was at that time. Hmm. And another thing I was confronted with that turned out to not be what they thought it could be, um, that would have meant a five-year prediction of the rest of my life um, was like, well, I've got five years. Let me figure out how to how to do it best. And I realized I wasn't afraid of it. I was able to confront it and deal with it. So, so. afraid of getting hurt, that's different. Yeah. Afraid of illness, afraid of what happens to the loved ones around me way more than what happens to myself. Huh. How do you think that's informed your process as a writer? And, and Well, it's definitely deepened me, you yeah. know, uh, getting married to Cynthia. Uh, we've been married 41 years now. Um, I definitely learned how to feel more deeply about people and about relationships in ways that I was blind to before that. She definitely deepened me. Mm -hmm. First thing I ever directed this TV movie for Disney called Fuzz Bucket. <laughs> <laughs> a kid is lost and then comes back to his family nobody hugs nobody's crying nobody and she said why isn't anybody hugging in there and you, oh yeah you know and just <laughs> didn't realize that you can watch that film now and it's like whoa where is this explosive <laughs> emotional joy of being brought back together but no she definitely deepened me i have a question about process just because it's something i saw recently on uh, posted online and it was conflicting advice for writers Stephen uh. King has apparently said that you shouldn't keep like a notebook of ideas that the important ones and the good ones you'll just remember and that if you write down everything you think of it'll, it'll clutter you too much and then I forget who the other author was but their suggestion was to write every idea down so that you could build off of them later so very ideas in contrast yeah. when it comes to so what, what's your approach I rarely write things down but I often forget things that I <laughs> that I should have written down um, but I think you can't tell another writer how to do what they do sure you know it's... and it, it may be King saying this is how I am mm -hmm. but reading his book on writing yeah is him saying this is what I do and maybe it can be helpful to you but he's not telling anybody how to do something. That's the only way to do or, or it. That's mm -hmm. the only way. And I don't know if you've read the book. It's the yeah. best book on the creative process, in my opinion, I, well, that I've ever seen. So mm -hmm. I can say that's ever been written. But, <laughs> but um, you know, everybody works in a different way. Uh, a lot of people, when they write, they outline everything extensively before they sit down and write a script. I sit down on page one and just go through to page 107 or whatever it is. Um, if I'm working in, on spec, but if you're writing for a studio or a network or a streamer or somebody, you have to lay out every step of the process. And so I, it's why I said earlier, I don't want to pitch an idea and then get paid to develop it with a studio. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather just write it on spec and let them buy or pass as they will. I, the process of development is just <laughs> agonizing. Yeah, it it could be draining. I bet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it it kicks all the creativity out of you. you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, 
Yeah, I've heard uh, George R. R. Martin say that <clears throat> writers can be architects or gardeners. Yeah, <laughs> planning everything in advance before and plotting it out before starting, or his method: plant seeds of ideas and let them grow naturally wherever they go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's more like what I do. Yeah, but a lot of people I know, Clive Barker plans things out very well, and who's a better writer than Clive Barker? You know, <laughs> yeah. he he and King approach things from opposite aspects, and and I often use this as an example that King sets the magic in a very real world where Clive writes a magical world but makes it feel real. Mm. You know, yeah. if you, you, they work from entirely different approaches, but they're both brilliant at what they do and the best at what they do. Mm. Yeah, and you need that diversity. As, yeah. As a consumer, I, <laughs> that's what I want is Yeah, different. I want that. Well, just like there's different things that terrify us, you know. Mm-hmm. There's different. Our brains all work differently. How we Absolutely. how we communicate, how we tell stories is different. So naturally, the process yeah. would be different. And yeah. yet, if fears weren't universal, there wouldn't be horror movies and horror novels. That's true. Sure. You know, I figure if it scares me, it's going to scare you. Yeah, it'll scare someone. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Here's hoping. Well, we ask people on this show what their nightlight is. So amidst all the things that do scare us universally. What is the thing that keeps you going? What's the light at the end of the tunnel when you wake up from the nightmare? Well, I like I say, I rarely remember dreaming and uh, rarely remember nightmares, but what keeps me going is the idea of telling another story. Uh-huh. You know, just creative ideas, making another movie, uh, working with talented people. You know, when you make a film, you surround yourself with 50 to 100 to 200 talented people all in the same ballpark trying to hit the home run together and the like. Um, but the idea of of sitting down alone in my office and creating a, a, a story about someone who never existed, but to make you believe that they did and and take you into surprising places you don't expect that might hurt, that might make you laugh, that might make you jump that might make you look over your shoulder with fear, um, but makes you feel something. I, I love creating stories that make you feel personal pain. <laughs> you know? And I don't necessarily mean physical, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I love stories that are emotionally painful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love reading them and I love writing them. Yeah, but because it's in that that we really grow, right? It's like yeah. the whole, there's that like, Oh, gosh, the, like, uh, lobster metaphor. Have you ever heard about this? No. Uh, and I'm probably butchering it, and I may this may not be scientifically accurate, but I've heard <laughs> it before, and I like it. Um, so basically, um, lobsters uh, in, in the wild have – they can't um, – they can't uh, – their shell doesn't grow with them. They have to. Uh-huh. They have to shed it. But they can't, uh-huh. like some like mollusks, like make a new shell and just climb into it. It has to grow. It's kind of like our, right. our it's fingernails. Part of them. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like our fingernails. And to do it, it's like this very painful thing where they have to kind of physically break themselves out of their the thing that wow. contains them because it's getting too tight and then they're like really vulnerable for a while and like raw and squishy and they have to like hide under a rock. But if they don't do it, they don't grow. Right. And they'll die anyway. Oh, great metaphor. So it's like they have to, so you have to challenge yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you Break have to. Break that shell. Yeah, on a, like, yeah. Otherwise you won't grow. And, and if you've been doing something for as many years as I have, you always want to feel like you're improving, you're growing, you're, you're getting better, you're telling better stories in a better way, you know. It's always wonderful when somebody comes up and say, says to me, hey, I love Critters too. It's my favorite thing you've done. I really love it, yep. and I appreciate it, but it's the first movie I ever made. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're and, like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, so you're never disappointed when somebody compliments you on your work, but you always want what you're doing now yeah. and what you're going to be doing to be – as exciting as what you did in the beginning. Because a lot of creatives do calcify. They mm-hmm. they come upon a, a formula that works, 
and has success, and they stay on that successful plane until people get tired of it, mm-hmm. rather than trying something new every time out. Well, it has been amazing sitting down <laughs> with you. What is something oh, new that you're trying that everybody can? Well, two here? days after I wrapped the podcast, I started a new spec script oh. and finished it three weeks later. I just just this morning finished doing a polish on it. Oh, nice. And so it's going to start going out. And it's something really exciting and really different. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I announced uh, on our final podcast at the Egyptian that I had two ideas that I was going to start that week. One of them commercial, one of them not. Guess which one I did? <laughs> <laughs> the not. <laughs> But so far, being very well received, and we'll see what happens with that. Great, I look forward to I that. Know, I know. But I've got a, a Stephen King project, that uh, a series that I've written the pilot and outlined the first season that we're going out with with a couple of uh, major actors. And Clive Barker and I have created a, an anthology show together, that, that all new original stories of his that was going to be for Shudder, and that didn't work out, so we'll see. Mm. But um, always a lot of stuff out there, yeah. And now I have more time to do it since I'm not doing the <laughs> <a> podcast. <Yeah. laughs> but if people want to find out more about you or listen to other episodes of your podcast, where can they do that? Oh, yeah, they just go to any of the podcast uh, services, you know, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify or uh, any of them, and, and just look up Postmortem with Mick Garris, and they're like 280 shows. <laughs> Excellent. Time to time yeah. to keep you company. <laughs> yeah, plenty of them, with people ranging from you know John Carpenter to Mike Flanagan to Guillermo del Toro to Stephen King to to uh, Quentin Tarantino to James Wan and all steps in between. Well, we can't wait. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, today. pleasure to be here. Giving uh, us the podcast rub. I know, yeah. I know. I feel like I've been blessed by <laughs> <laughs> by a prophet or something here. Oh, um, it's just the long white hair. Don't let it fool you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you liked what you listened to, uh, please like, subscribe. We do um, shorter episodes on the podcast platforms and on YouTube, and full extended ad free cuts on our Patreon. You can ring the bell, yeah, for notifications <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, yeah, uh, write into us. Tell us what, who you'd like to see on the show. What you like. What what you, what resonates with you. What your nightmares are. What and you didn't like. <laughs> you can tell us. Well, you know, I'll take it. I read. But be I've, nice about it, please. I'm the, I'm a little sensitive. I don't know. I'll, <laughs> I've read worse comments. Trust me. <laughs> Um, uh, anyway, uh, until next time, I am Catherine Corcoran. And I'm James A. Janice. Be sure to leave the light on.